press record, so here we go. So beginning with honoring the Buddha, and this is such a um, important practice to, to question ourselves, to inquire, where do we place our respect? Where do we honor? Who do we honor? What do we honor in our lives? Um, do we honor being um, productive? Do we honor getting through our list of to do, you know, tasks to do today? Uh, do we remember in all things to honor uh, that quality of presence, that inner presence to ourselves? Um, it's a reminder to honor the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one who is present, who is our essential nature. Uh, it's not something external to ourselves, although we might image it as something external to ourselves uh, to help uh, connect to it. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Udang saranang gachami, damang saranang gachami, sangam saranang gachami. Duti ampi budang saranang gachami, duti ampi damang saranang gachami. Duty and peace, Tati and pe, Buddhang, Saranang, Gachami. Tati and pe, Damang, Saranang, Gachami. Tati and pe, Sangam, Saranang, Gachami. So taking the five precepts, uh, it's uh, such, such an uh, essential and foundational practice that we do uh, to affirm our commitment to non-harming, to affirm our understanding that uh, we are part of a web of life. We are interdependent. We arise in each moment, each moment arises uh, interdependent on so many factors, so many conditions. And we arise in each moment interdependently, we arise together. And so bringing this commitment to the best of our ability to refrain from causing harm, and to cultivate the conditions to support life, to create uh, beneficial conditions for the thriving of life. And um, so we can, we can bring this into our statement, into our, our uh, chanting of these refuges, the refraining part, which is explicit, but how would we like to also cultivate and can we cultivate um, these more positive beneficial conditions for life to be, 
to support living beings, to, to be generous, to connect our erotic energies to the life around us in ways that brings joy and connection and love and intimacy, to speak the truth uh, with, with courage and with kindness and to refrain from um, addictive behaviors which lead us away from clarity and presence. Panati pata veramani sikapadam samadiyami. Adinadana veramani sikapadam samadiyami. Kamesu michachara veramani sikapadam. Samadhyami. Musawada veramani sikapadam samadhyami. Sura Maria Maja Pamadatana veramani sikapadam samadhyami. Ida misila maga fala yanasa pachayo hotu. Sadu, 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 anumodami. So we've been moving um, gradually through the Satipatthana Sutta uh, in our um, Dhamma reflections and um, uh, and in the last uh, couple of weeks we've been working with uh, the fourth Satipatthana, so Dhammas, um, sometimes translated formations, but um, just using the word dhammas. Um, I think a lot of teachers find it, it's, it's a complex word to, uh, to translate because um, sometimes it's translated mental formations, um, but it's not just mental. It's not just in the mind, it's in the body as well. So, um, so we taught, we've talked about uh, sense desire and the way that drives us habitually um, uh, and, and how we can get so caught up in what we want, what we think we need and how the, these are conditionings that we experience collectively, it's, it's not something that just comes up as, a, you know, personally, it's not an individual thing. These, you know, the consumerism of our culture, the, the way that uh, an image of what, who we should be, what we should be, uh, gets imposed on us in so many ways, um, in our upbringings, in our, in our, in mass media, in our education, 
and um, and we're and how we're driven by this, and um, and similarly, uh, we talked about this in terms of um, the second hindrance, um, aversion, ill will, anger, and how uh, how we're shaped by our collective trauma. Uh, and um, and we internalize this, and we we see the th we see other we other different different peoples uh, depending on our conditioning um, by race by class by um, by different ways that we're taught to perceive, um, and we see them as somehow. Uh, different other, um, you know, there's um, many people uh, project this on people who want to uh, immigrate to this country or to their, whatever country they're in, that, that they're a threat. And so this, these, these ways that we create enmity and, and, um, uh, ill will and aversion and 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 it and it really it's not it's not just something which is conceptual it's something that we hold in the body uh, and it's and I, and I and I invited uh, the sangha to to really investigate this as in in our everyday experience uh, when in a, perhaps in subtle ways does aversion does a feeling of threat arise. You know, if we see somebody who we have othered in whatever way by race, by by class, by um, by in whatever way they present themselves, um, and um, and how you know when we touch into this, the suffering that it creates within us. Uh, and it takes courage and it takes uh, compassion to, to, to do this, to enter into this process of, of really um, uh, witnessing, witnessing um, our, our, um, before thought reactivity and to recognize uh, the suffering of it, to recognize the not self of it, that it's not me, it's not mine, it's not who I am, uh, it's not what I aspire to be. And to really uh, uh, own the collective nature of this, but also taking individual responsibility that we have the capacity through mindfulness, through our practice, through compassion to, to transform and to, to enter into our uh, engagement with the life around us in a different ways, uh, more liberated. Today, we're, we're looking at the third hindrance is which the third hindrance, which is um, uh, sloth and torpor. Um, so, um, and this is something that uh, we we experience in the body as well as in the mind. Um, there are two words which are used to describe it. Uh, so, and one. Um, has been ascribed more to the body and uh, the sloth and the torpor has been ascribed more to the mind. I'm gonna read it just um, the, the paragraph in the Satipatthana Sutta, just remembering that this whole section on, uh, on formations on dhammas is, uh, is looking not only at the awareness of, the, uh, of how this state arises within us, but also 
the conditionality of how it arises. What gives? What are the conditions that gives rise to us? What are the conditions that that uh, uh, allows it to be let go, to to uh, to move through us and to move on, and to notice not only when the when this dhamma is is present, but also when it's not present and what that's like to examine mindfully. Uh, what is it like to be free of sense desire, to be free of ill will, to be free of sloth and torpor? If sloth and torpor is present, is present within, one knows sloth and torpor is present within me. Or if sloth and torpor is not present within, one knows sloth and torpor is not present within me. And one knows how arisen sloth and torpor arises. One knows how arisen sloth and torpor is removed or abandoned. And one knows how re removed sloth and torpor does not arise in the future. So, so one thing that I think it's important to talk about, uh, you know, often these hindrances are, are spoken about primarily with regard to our meditation practice. I think it's really important that we talk about them not only uh, with regard to formal practice, but also with how we live our lives, because I think that how they show up in our lives and uh, and become uh, obstacles to mindfulness, obstacles to to being fully present, um, and and showing up and and acting and speaking from a uh, place of presence and groundedness in the heart and mind um, and who we truly are, uh, that, that we can notice that uh, not only in, in our formal practice, but also in our lives. And it's important to do so. So um, sometimes people can misunderstand working with this hindrance as uh, a need to to really um, push and push and push and and uh, bring a kind of um, a, a striving energy, a striving quality to practice uh, that you know we sh we should uh, deny ourselves sleep or I mean and this this happens more often in in a retreat setting, um, but but we also can bring that kind of striving, not only to meditation, but just to how we live our lives. Uh, and notice how, um, how we can be very harsh uh, with, with our whole being, with the body. Uh, it's something that I've um, really come into more awareness of in the last months how um, how how hard I have been on myself uh, for in in many ways just uh, thinking that really um, accomplishing things uh, getting through uh, what I have to do responding to you know these very very important emails um, which you know may be important. But uh, that kept me just sitting and sitting and sitting in front of my computer for so long and, um, and, and really uh, drove me into a kind of imbalance in my life. And so that striving energy, which I also have brought to my practice in, um, in past years uh, can, can be very harmful. So um, it's a kind of um, a denial of, uh, it's really a, a, an elevating, the doing, the performing, the uh, producing, you know, which is such a, 
a, a value of our capitalist patriarchal mindset um, that we have internalized. Um, so many of us have internalized and and, and really, I think that at the very heart of, of our Dharma practice is a, a loving, a caring for this quality of being, um, presence. And, um, and so, so this, uh, this striving nature is not the kind of antidote to this kind of energy of sloth and torpor. It's, um, that would be a, a misunderstanding. Actually, it's uh, a quality of sensitivity uh, within the body, a sensitivity to, to what is uh, happening in the mind that is the, uh, the way that we proceed when we notice that the body feels sluggish, the mind feels cloudy. Uh, there's a, a quality of heaviness in the body and mind. <coughs> a sense of a, a kind of shutting down of the mind. Um, and so the, the way that we work with that is to bring investigation, to bring an inquiry. Um, like, what, what is this? What's, what is this? Uh, experience that's that's unfolding right now of of, um, of sloth and torpor and and looking at the conditionality of it. So, what are the conditions that give rise to sloth and torpor? And so, uh, sometimes looking at that can we can realize the body is really tired. Uh, you know, and like been working really hard, uh, slept very badly, and and maybe maybe it's not the time to meditate right now. Uh, maybe it it might be better to to walk, to um, to be outside, to be in nature, uh, to perhaps read uh, read a, a text that's inspiring. Um, or listen to a Dharma talk. So, um, so being open to how we want to engage right now, what would be the best practice for us, um, or, or maybe to chant or to do a metta practice. Um, so, um, but sometimes, when we inquire as to, you know, what what are the conditions that are giving rise to this uh, quality of uh, the mind closing down or the mind wanting to just uh, turn turn away, maybe uh, space out, go into a kind of a dream state. Um, sometimes we discover that that there's a, a kind of avoidance that's happening. And this can happen when uh, in our meditation, something's coming up. And this has happened for me. This is something I've discovered in, in my practice um, uh, in, in, on retreat um, at times when, when I'm meditating and I notice that the mind is just kind of wanting to shut down or, the, or Sometimes it, sometimes it uh, manifests not as sloth and torpor, but as re restlessness, like a lot of thinking, 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 which uh, is the next hindrance. We'll talk about that next week. Um, and, and then when I just really look at it or just I am with it, just giving it space to be known and uh, recognizing that there's something coming up on a deeper level that, that there's an avoidance and that the, the shutting down of the mind, the wanting to go to sleep, the wanting to just turn off can be a, a way of just uh, turning away from that. Um, and so uh, 
So just bringing a, a compassionate inquiry, like uh, what is what is happening here? What's what's emerging? Um, I I'm listening. I'm open. I'm present. Um, caring. I care. I care about what's happening. Sometimes uh, it could it could emerge as a feeling of discomfort or pain of the, in the heart. Uh, suffering. So um, sometimes when we feel that the that the body is is really sluggish and um, you know just kind of feeling lazy. Um, we can bring the, we need to balance uh, this, this the, the body with, you know, the, there's another meditation factor called um, virya or energy. It's also stated in another way as one of the eightfold uh, path factors, uh, right effort. So, so it might just, uh, there might just be a kind of arousing of energy that can happen um, by lifting through the spine, um, bringing the energy up through the spine, just kind of bringing our attention from the base of the spine up through the crown of the head or, or doing a body scan, just um, bringing energy, uh, attention, uh, awareness through the whole body um, up through to the uh, top of the skull, uh, as you have all, I think, practiced um, in, in various ways and different times. So, um, so this this balancing, this bringing in of another factor. Sometimes, sometimes as the mind begins to settle, you know, if we we have a lot of uh, restless energy and 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 we are bringing attention to the breath or to another meditation object, like uh, feeling the touch of the body on the, uh, on the seat of the chair or, or in the hands and, and the attention begins to settle. And, and maybe what was really keeping us awake and alert was a lot of nervous energy, a lot of just drivenness. And so as, as that begins to subside and settle, sometimes we find that, that there can be a, a, um, a kind of a dullness that comes in. And, and so then bringing right effort, you know, balancing energy, you know, it's uh, that, that, that quality of the mind kind of, be, be becoming a little bit more concentrated, a little bit more settled and collected, and yet lacking the energy and the alertness, uh, that's, that's a particular uh, pitfall um, called sinking mind. And the mind kind of sinks down and becomes dull. And so then uh, we can bring that, uh, that sense of right effort to, to just, uh, awaken ourselves, renew our energy, open the eyes perhaps, um, uh, brighten the mind, even literally uh, bringing a sense of light or just connecting with clarity or bringing just that joy as Analio talks about so much, um, that, that joy of presence, joy of showing up in the present moment. Uh, just this, just this moment. Um, the sufficiency of that, the contentment of that, the gratitude of that, however you might describe that. And then, and then you know, as I was talking about before, the inquiry of how does this uh, hindrance of sloth and torpor show up in my daily life? Um, so uh, 
So for me, it, it, it shows up as just that kind of inertia, like, okay, you know, I, I want to, I intend to, I uh, do whatever it is, the next thing that needs to be done, um, uh, that, you know, I, uh, I need to move from one thing to another, uh, it's calling me and that there's inertia, uh, this laziness or this procrastination um, that can come in. And, and so, right, just recognizing that can be a, uh, a help to, to bring it into awareness, um, to feel it in the body, to, uh, you know, whatever, uh, whatever we want to say to ourselves, to, to um, move through it, um, <coughs> or recognizing that, that this is uh, an engagement that will um, uh, or perhaps bring joy in the doing or, or that will bring a sense of satisfaction in the completion. Um, and um, yeah, turning toward inspiration, turning toward uh, reconnection with our motivation, whether it's to practice or to do something that uh, will be beneficial to engage with something in some way, study or, or a task or, um, uh, you know, it re reconnecting with what is our motivation for doing this. Um, the, there's a word that is not often used in, in uh, our contemporary, uh, language of the way that we talk about what we do. Uh, it's a word, uh, the word duty. It's, it's, it's our duty. And uh, I, I remember um, hearing it spoken by this, uh, I was <coughs> in India, um, staying with a family in, um, in Sarnath and um, and I was getting up early to go somewhere and, and I was surprised that they got up to, to be with me and to make sure that I got off well and properly. And, and, they, and they said, oh, it's our duty to do that. And I, I was touched by that word. Um, it, you know, it, it's, uh, and, and we do have things that are our duty or, or our responsibility and we can, you know, it may not be our, our preference, but we can embrace that, um, that recognition that, that this is something we need to do. Um, it's, it's something that we're called to do. Uh, and, um, and to honor that. So our motivations, um, our motivations can be very uh, wide, and uh, they don't always need to be our preference. Uh, one of the things that um, Analio talks about in terms of recalling motivation, uh, which, if you're familiar with his teaching, he he brings forward a lot, is uh, the recollection of death. So um, recollecting death, what is the import most important thing for me to do right now? Um, and and so, um, so that can be something that, that motivates us, whether it's to practice or to let go of something that we are uh, kind of clinging to that, um, that may be not supportive. Uh, not not be for our benefit or the benefit of others. Uh, so so just these these kinds of inquiries, these kinds of investigations, which can take many forms, uh, 
in terms of our dharma understanding, in terms of our uh, what our body is telling us, the wisdom, the inner wisdom of the body, uh, just inquiring into what's arising, uh, the sensitivity, bringing that sensitivity and inquiry to that. Um, so, so working with sloth and torpor is, is something that takes uh, uh, a lot of um, skill and um, yeah and, and looking at when is it resistance I didn't I haven't used that word yet but resistance I think is also an important word to use in this um, it kind of implied it in terms of procrastination um, and also in terms of um, but resistance can also come around come about uh, in relation to um, opening to uh, a letting go of habitual ways of being and uh, opening to greater possibilities of openness and freedom. Uh, resistance can be a kind of a stuckness in which we have a, a sense of holding on to a conception of self, a, a construction of self, that we are a certain way, um, that uh, to be freer, to be bolder, to be more compassionate, to be more engaged, to be more aligned with our, our deepest convictions, um, is beyond us. And so uh, I think that that kind of resistance, that stuckness, you know, when we consider perhaps doing something or engaging in some way or, or uh, reaching out in some way, um, that we have this uh, holding back. And, and that also, I think, can be examined in the light of uh, what is this, what is, what is this stuckness that I'm feeling right now? So, uh, so let's bring that, that kind of inquiry into our practice as we um, prepare to, to sit in meditation. Let's take a moment to, uh, if you want to, to, <coughs> To get up, to stretch, to uh, to move around a little bit. I think that's also helpful uh, to get the body out of a um, kind of a sleepiness. If if that's if the sound of my voice has been uh, lulling you into into any kind of um, yeah disconnection or Definitely not my intention, but it could happen. <laughs> so it can also be helpful as we begin a meditation. Um, uh, if you want to do this now uh, or um, in your in your other you know at other times of practice to, to to sprinkle some if you feel sleepy to sprinkle some water on your face uh, to to do some stretches to take some deep breaths oxygenate the blood uh, helps the brain to be more alert to do some, uh, yeah, some stretches, some movements, all of these are good for um, proactively uh, working with sloth and torpor before you sit or whatever, um, whatever posture you're in.
So let's gather the attention in the body. So bringing awareness in the body, feeling the, the body in connection with the earth, in connection with the space, the air around us, perhaps uh, bringing awareness of your environment, perhaps um, if you're going to close your eyes, just taking a moment before you close your eyes to connect with something that, an object that brings you joy, uh, a, an object that inspires you with the beauty, perhaps a flower, a piece of art, a plant, or perhaps looking out the window at the sky, the, the trees, um, bringing yourself into connection with the world around us, perhaps looking at the screen and, and seeing the faces of our friends, our, our siblings, siblings in the Dharma, siblings in aging, illness and death. and feeling the breath in the body. Connecting the, the breath with awareness. this mingling of breath and awareness. Brings our attention into the body. With a, a felt sense of the life energy, the prana. That the word Anapana in Pali points to breathing in, breathing out. It's the Anapana is the same word as prana used in yoga to point to the life energy. So this life energy is an energy of presence, awakeness. It nourishes our attention.
bringing some inquiry into this dhamma of sloth and torpor. And so noticing if it is present, if it is, inquiring as to the conditions that give rise to it, inquiring as to the nature of sloth and torpor when it's present, and inquiring as to the passing away, what conditions support the passing away of sloth and torpor. And also bringing awareness, sati, mindfulness to that nature of mind. How is the mind? How is the body in the absence of sloth and torpor? What is the quality? of presence, what is the quality of attention when sloth and torpor is absent?
in the last few minutes of our practice, I'd like to invite forward, uh, if this feels right for you, the heart quality of metta, of love, amour, kindness, goodwill. First of all, for this being sitting on your cushion, your chair, practicing in whatever posture you may be, the appreciation and love for this body, mind, heart that we experience, experience as life can, comes into being through the senses. Wishing ourselves well, kindness, just bringing the love, appreciation, gratitude for life. and allowing this field of goodwill, of kindness to extend in all directions. Wishing well to all those we know and those we don't know. If any beings come into your field of awareness, Just um, sending, sending that energy, that, that quality of heart, of, of metta to each one. If any places, situations arise, Sending compassion, if that is connecting with the suffering or, or joy, connecting with the well being, with the beauty of any life system that may come into our awareness. And with a sense of deep gratitude for the goodness of our practice, for any clarity, any openness, insight, freedom that may have emerged in practice today. We can dedicate the goodness of that, the blessing of that to to particular beings, and to all beings. Is there a particular being to whom you wish to dedicate your practice? The blessings of your practice today. It's perhaps naming that to yourself. May the blessings, the goodness of our practice and the goodness of our lives, the way that we bring virtue and kindness into our lives in so many ways. May this serve and support the happiness, well-being and liberation of all beings. <clears throat> 